Police are looking for the person who pulled the trigger. You know, in the streets, power respects power. Chapter One, The Family. Miss T was born and raised in Harlem, New York. She grew up on 134th Street and 8th Avenue with her two sisters. I lived on 133rd and 7th Avenue, then we just moved right down the block to 134th and 8th Avenue. She was raised by her American-born mother and Jamaican father. Despite growing up in a strict household, T became intrigued by the street life. T's uncles, Wild Al and Big Stan, were heavy in the drug game. They were brothers, same mother, same father, two totally different personalities. They had drug spots in Harlem. In 1986, T started selling drugs on 123rd Street for Al and Stan. Al mainly hustled on Edgecombe Avenue with his business partner, Jacob. Chapter 2, Wild Al. In 1986, Al was shot and killed. It is said Jacob allegedly hired someone to kill him. After Al died, T started bottling up crack for Stan. She later moved from bottling to collecting money off the blocks. Al did what he wanted to do, how he wanted to do it, and sometimes he did things without even thinking. It was scary sometimes because you just didn't know what he was going to do or how. You know, he just did things on his own terms and he was just crazy. You know, he was definitely a wow guy. You'll turn around and in the room you got grenades in the bedroom. Where he get these things from, I had no idea. I think he was probably one of the only American dudes that the Jamaicans allowed on Edgecombe because if anybody from Harlem remembers Edgecombe Avenue, the Jamaicans had that on lock. Nobody can go up there and hustle. But Al and his crew was able to do that and you know, I guess he was probably just as wild as they were and they were dangerous. Those guys up there were dangerous. A lot of people um, lost their lives up there. Jacob and my uncle hustled together up on Edgecombe Avenue. At one time, they were really good friends. You know, they got money together, but at some point, something went wrong. Jacob had my uncle killed by another guy that worked with them, and we knew it. You know, we were told little things here and there, and after it happened, the guy that Jacob allegedly got to kill my uncle, we never saw him again. So after Al died, I stuck understand he would have me chopping up crack, bottling it up. And then after a while, he had some other girls doing it that lived in a project, some on the east side, some on the west side. So then basically most of the time I would just be riding around with him. And when it was time to take the work out on the block, I did that. Um, when it was time to take money, I did that. You know, it was just something that was fun to me. So that's basically what I did. Chapter 3, Gold. After Norm, T started dating another drug dealer named Dog. In 1987, I met Dog. Dog hustled out on Manhattan Avenue with his partner, Kev Frost. Kev Frost was 15, Dog was a couple of years older. These dudes are getting money. 
T eventually broke up with Dog after he was sentenced to five years in prison. In the summer of 1987, T met Unique. They soon started dating. Unique was allegedly a major drug dealer. He is credited with creating the popular party chant. Ayo, I He was also the owner of Mecca Hall Audio. Ultimately, T and Unique went their separate ways but remained good friends. Unique was a unique individual. He was um, living with someone in my building. And um, I think we met on an elevator. Yeah, we started dealing with one another and, you know, we had our relationship, but I probably was more into it than he was in a sense, but we were very close. We spent a lot of time together. He was the first guy that I ever seen with a money machine. That's the first time I seen a money machine. You know, he had like bags of jewelry and he always said black. He named me black. He said, and you spend money on jewelry, make sure it's good jewelry because you never know when you have those rainy days. That always stuck with me because trust me, I've been to the pawn shop before and I've seen some dude from the streets that I know had money in the same pawn shop with me one time. So you know, those days come, those rainy days definitely come. He loved to party. Just being with him outside was like a party. He wanted to have fun. He loved to smoke his weed. He had nice cars, dressed nice. Whenever he was around him, he was going to take care of you, you know, look out for you, and you was guaranteed a good time. Talking about Unique, you got to mention Club 2Gs. I mean, Club 2000, I have memories of those days like none other. He knew how to throw a party, and he knew how to bring the right people through to make the party jump. You know, he had all kind of rappers come through, Luke dancers, Uncle Luke, LL in there, Red Man. So many people came through to see what was going on. And yes, Unique was the one who came up with that phrase, A-O-I. That was definitely him. Being around him, he made you happy. He made you smile, he made you laugh. And those Club 2000 days was definitely hitting and definitely missed those days. Chapter 4, The Lynch Mob Lou Sims was from Uptown. He was allegedly a chief enforcer for The Lynch Mob. Lou was doing his thing in the street. The Lynch Mob was a notorious Harlem drug crew. They hustled all over Harlem, but their main location was 142nd Street in Lenox. The crew was allegedly headed by Leon. Leon and I were really good friends. He was my daughter's godfather as well. Lou and Leon met in school. After being released from a stint in prison, Lou reconnected with Leon. The lynch mob ran a multi-million dollar crack cocaine business. They supplied drugs to numerous parts of the country, including Alabama. In 1989, T and Lou started dating. T first met Lou when she was five or six years old. T's cousin and Lou were childhood friends. Lou was around me when I was young. He and my cousin 
Ronnie Ball, they used to be together back in the days. In 1989, I ran back into Lou. He has a beautiful smile. You know, he's a nice looking guy. He loves to play, tell jokes. He wasn't always somebody who was mean and running around doing crazy stuff, you know, like people think that he was doing. No, he was a human being. He wasn't a monster. Lou is definitely a good person. He really is. Lou had a good relationship with my sister, my aunt, you know, as well as my cousins. So, you know, he was definitely a part of my family at some point. So, you know, those are good memories that I have of what he and I had. Leon, he was a sweetheart. I really genuinely can say that I had a lot of love for that guy and um, love, trust, all of that. He was definitely a good person who was there and would help someone. He was definitely like a brother, a good friend to me. And um, that's what I like to remember about Leon. I'm gonna be honest with you. I didn't even hear the name Lynch Mob until they all got arrested. I don't know where that name came from. Maybe they did use it, but I honestly never heard it until the newspapers had that in there. If they were using that name, I didn't hear it. And then it could have been because I kind of separated myself at some point from what was going on uptown, of course, because Lou and I weren't dealing with each other anymore and I was somewhere else doing my own thing. Chapter 5, Vengeance In 1990, Jacob was shot dead while talking on a payphone. It was alleged Jacob was killed in revenge for the death of Wild Al and a beef with T-Money over Jacob's wife. Al's best friend Rashid was allegedly behind Jacob's murder. After Jacob died, his younger brother vowed to avenge his death. One evening, T, Lou, Stan, and a few others were standing on 134th Street. Everybody was out there just talking and, you know, doing our thing or whatever. All of a sudden, they were ambushed by three or four hooded gunmen. T, Lou, and Stan escaped the shooting unscathed, while two others were injured. Jacob's brother was going after people who he thought was responsible for his brother's death. T Money was a hustler from 127th Street. One night, T Money was sitting in his vehicle with a passenger. Jacob's brother allegedly walked up to the vehicle and opened fire. T Money and his passenger died at the scene. Jacob's brother eventually tracked down Rashid and shot him multiple times. And he caught him. He caught him off guard. Rashid died in front of Harlem's Mark 125. Mark 25, which was a popular shopping mall. However, Jacob's brother's murder spree came to an abrupt end. He ended up getting killed by an unknown assailant. His murder still remains unsolved. Nineteen ninety, on this particular day, me, Lou, Stan, and about two other dudes were in the middle of one thirty third and one thirty fourth. Now my back was turned to the building, so I'm facing the street. Lou was facing the building; his back was to the street. 
and he can see towards 134th Street. But there was a look that came over his face that told me it was something that wasn't good. But it happened in slow motion, yet it happened so fast. He looked, I looked at him, then before I could turn to look, he pushed me and took off. All I can hear was one dude go, there that motherfucker go, and the shots were being fired, but they weren't after Lou, they were after Stan. The good thing is that they were working on my mother's building, so there was a scaffold there, and we all were kind of standing under that. That is probably what saved Stan. Although one of the guys that was out there with us got shot in his behind. But Stan was able to go towards 133rd, run up to St. Nick's Avenue, and then he disappeared. The crazy thing is this happened on the evening of Jacob's wake. So his brother wasn't even trying to wait until his brother was buried. He was so in a trance from my understanding from people who knew him. You know, losing Jacob was like losing his world. It literally ended this kid's world. After the attempt on Stan, Jacob's little brother went on an all out rampage. Again, going after people who he thought was responsible for his brother's death. And he ended up sneaking up on T-Money and a guy named Rodney who had absolutely nothing to do with this beef whatsoever. T-Money and Lou were real tight. They were very good friends. And then after that, I believe is when Jacob's little brother ran up on Rashid. And it's alleged that Rashid is the one that killed Jacob, maybe because it was alleged that Jacob killed Al. Jacob's little brother caught Rashid on 125th Street. Rashid is a person that was definitely about his business too. But again, we have a young kid whose world was ended when his brother got killed. His stakeout game must have been crazy because he was just catching everybody or attempting to do so. But the little brother ended up getting killed. Who killed him? I have no idea. Why they killed him? I have no idea. I'm not sure if it was because of what he had done to others. I really don't know. It could have been anybody because he had done so much in such a short period of time. But to be honest with you, I don't think that he ever thought of himself as far as caring whether he lived or died. He set out to do some things and he accomplished what he set out to do for the most part. I will say this, and I said it in my book, if you want to do it and avenge the death of your loved one, that's how you do it. You know, I have to give credit where credit is due. You know, I'm from the street and if someone hurts someone you love to the point where you feel like that's all that you can do to feel better, this young man felt pain that he had probably never felt before. So I understand why he felt the way he felt and why he did what he did. Now I will say this, I don't know if Stan had anything to do with that. I don't even know why Jacob's little brother even came after Stan. So I'm gonna put that out there as well. I'm just talking about the way of going about taking care of business when somebody hurts somebody that you love. He was just a shell of a person once Jacob got killed. He was like literally not there anymore. And you know, I feel bad for the young kid because that wasn't his life. And from my understanding, that's not the life that Jacob wanted from him. He was a kid that played ball and wasn't into the streets like that. And it's unfortunate that he was put in that situation to have to go out like that. Chapter 6, The Phone Call Rich Porter was a major player in the Harlem drug trade. In 1989, Rich Porter's little brother Donnell was kidnapped and held for ransom. Rich was, you know, he was kind of a big deal to Harlem. You know, Harlem was known for getting money. We were known for wanting to dress nice, having cars. The dudes, you know, had the fly chicks and the chicks always wanted the flyest dudes that was getting money. 
And in the late 80s, you had AZ, you had Rich Porter that was from 7th Avenue, 132nd Street, they was getting money. AZ was more on the low key side. Rich Porter was that dude that had the cars, the clothes, the big jewelry, and all he did was wanted to floss. We didn't even use that term back then, but you know, he had swag and he was flossing. He was that dude that once he came driving up the block, everybody knew who he was. He was somebody that all the girls liked to see coming. He was also the dude that other dudes wanted to be like. You know, those days were good. Those days were good. Then there came a time where his little brother got kidnapped and he needed to find his brother. Things were going on. The kidnappers demanded a ransom of $500,000 for Donnell's safe release. Rich turned to his cocaine connect Fritz and asked for the funds. You see, Rich Porter was having problems accumulating the money to pay for the ransom for his brother. So what he did is he went to speak to Fritz about some help in, far, in regards to some money to help pay to get his brother back. So what Fritz did, he gave him a large sum of money plus 30 keys of coke to sell that he could, you know, raise the money to help pay to get his brother back and as well as, you know, step off the game because he could no longer hustle no more because the feds was already involved. They already know about him, what his lifestyle was about and everything. And the reason why his brother got kidnapped is because he, they know he was a drug dealer. So they needed that money from him. But unfortunately, he didn't have enough money to pay to get his brother back. His main man, you know, AZ and Alpo, I guess, you know, they wasn't willing to help all. They didn't have that kind of money to help him to get his brother back. Because the three of them was real tight. So he had to go outside of them to get to raise some money. And that's why he went and speak to Fritz. In 1990, Rich Porter was found shot to death on City Island in the Bronx. Two weeks later, Donnell Porter's body was discovered. In the midst of all that, Rich Porter gets killed. The kidnapping of his brother threw Harlem for a loop. It was a sad time. It was all over the news. It was in the newspaper. You know, Harlem was just in an uproar because he was a baby. Then Rich Porter body gets found. That really threw Harlem for a loop because he was loved by a lot of people. Loved, liked, envied, whatever you want to call it, but he definitely had Harlem's attention. So, um, one day, I'm in the house, I get a phone call. So the caller says, yeah, bitch, we know Lou killed Rich. They gonna find your body in the river. So I'm like, what? The caller hangs up, Lou comes in, I tell him what happened. So I was like, yo, you need to go to 132nd Street, up to 7th Avenue and see what's going on. Because if somebody calling the house, number one, they saying he did something that he didn't do. And two, they threatening to kill me and throw me in the river. And I'm like, yo, what the fuck is going on, me? So he went to 32nd Street, but before he leaves, I tell him, yo, put the bulletproof vest on, get that thing and see what's going on. I'm making sure that he go up there right. So he goes up there, but he comes back fast. He told me everything was fine. It wasn't really no need for me to question him because if he tell me everything good, everything good. So I wasn't really worried about anything. And that was the situation that, you know, your name ring bells and people just want to blame you for certain things and you don't have anything to do with it. You know, it just seems like at the time when bodies was dropping here and there, that's all you heard was Lou Sim's name, you know, blaming him for the things that were going on. But I knew Lou didn't do that. Chapter 7, 112th Street In the summer of 1990, T met Fritz. Fritz was a big-time drug kingpin from 112th and St. Nicholas Ave. A good friend of mine was like a niece to him, so I met Fritz. He was known for providing coke on consignment to drug dealers in Harlem. T 
she was then introduced to Fritz's best friend and business partner, Ace. Ace was from the east side of Harlem. Ace took a liking to tea and started showering her with money and gifts. T ultimately broke up with Lou. Following the split, T started dating Ace. Eventually, they moved in together. In the fall of 1990, T found out she was pregnant. Upon hearing the news, Ace proposed to her. I met Fritz. You know, he just looked like a regular guy, to be honest with you. He didn't look like your typical drug dealer who would be flashy, you know, with the clothes, the jewelry. Nah, that wasn't him. He would sell coke on consignment to whoever wanted to get some money. So he'll give it to you on an arm and you pay later. And he had it to do it. He was definitely the man that I said created bosses in the streets. If he didn't deal with you directly, most likely whatever work you got came from him, no matter who you got it from. He was definitely that dude making it happen. Not arrogant, nothing like that. One day, when I was down on 112th Street, Fritz said, T, somebody like you. So I said, who? And he said, Ace. And um, he seemed to be a real nice guy. Him too, looked ordinary. You know, he drove a nice motorcycle. He um, didn't dress flashy. I found out later, you know, he was from the Caribbean and he just dressed in like dockers and stuff like that. Nothing that says or screamed, I'm a drug dealer, I'm getting money. Now, originally, Ace was from 129th Street and Madison Avenue. He had a little situation, and he ended up on 112th Street with Fritz. You know, Fritz became like a big brother to him, a mentor and best friend. So, you know, Ace and I got real cool. We would talk on the phone a lot. He would come by my mom's building and see me. He would give me money. He would give me a lot of money. I would go shopping, and I would also take Lou shopping because he was my boyfriend. I had to kind of hide the fact that I'm spending money that somebody else gave me. I made it look like, you know, it was money that I was getting from my mom. Cause you know, my mom always gave us money. Oh, I had a little something from Stan. So I already had a, you know, always had something. But after a while, you know, I guess Lou probably started to suspect, okay, she getting clothes, she buying a little jewelry. You know, Lou and I started to fizzle out and you know, I say he was acting up. And then Ace, you know, he was, seeming more and more attractive and um he was a good guy i mean i never had roses i had a guy send me roses he would send dozens of roses to my mom's house i would come from school and there would be a dozen roses on the table and i don't know if he did it like every week but it seemed like i got a lot of roses and i thought that was just like so nice and i'm like okay you know some grown man stuff and that made me happy so, you know, me and Lou, we got into our little thing. We ended up breaking up. Before we broke up, I did tell Lou where I was getting the money from because he's not stupid. But I did, you know, express the fact that this is a nice guy. He's giving me money. I never did anything with him. Never had a sexual relationship with the guy. He's just a nice guy. And I said I would stop taking the money. I'm not sure if I did or not. Nevertheless, after me and Lou broke up, you know, Ace was right there. It's like, okay, why not? now? If it was any other dude, I probably would have been very cautious and hit it because, you know, Lou being, you know, who he was, it's like, okay, your girl leaves you or y'all break up. Sometimes they don't want to see you with nobody else. Not that anybody was scared of anybody, but you know, in the streets, power respects power. And it goes without saying, words don't have to be spoken. Okay, this is who I'm with now. You doing you, I'm doing me. Being with Ace was next level. I was 20 going on 21 and to be 20 years old I end up with a man who has money he moves me into his apartment uptown 
He gave me an Acura Legend to drive. We had a 325 BMW, which was stick shift, so that's probably why I didn't drive that. A customized van, and he had his bike. You know, having that at 20 years old was a big deal. We also had, well, he showed me, okay, listen, this is emergency money in the drawer, about $30,000. If anything happens, you know, you go in here, you use it. We also had two dogs, Bad Boy and Hitman. My dogs had their own apartment in a brownstone. So it was kind of like, okay, wow, this is, um, this is nice. It was really, really nice. And you know, just being with somebody who seemed like a big deal. At the end of the day, back then, most of us girls that were in the street, that our desire was to be with a guy who was getting it. So, you know, that's just how it was. But living the life with a drug dealer, especially a drug dealer who's doing a lot. You know, it comes with some sacrifices. There were times where I wouldn't see him 12 hours out the day, maybe 19 hours out the day. And although, okay, I have money to spend, I could ride around with my girls, I could basically do what I want to do, it's like, okay, but where's my man? Chapter 8, The Safe In 1991, Ace was arrested in connection with a 1987 murder. He was indicted and denied bail. Although Ace was completely innocent of the charge, While Ace was away, T took control of the business. Her duties included moving kilos of cocaine and collecting money owed to Ace. On Fritz's recommendation, T brought a safe to store the drug money. One day, three masked intruders armed with guns forced their way into her apartment. T was held at gunpoint and forced to open the safe. The intruders stole $150,000 cash and jewelry before fleeing. I got a phone call from Ace stating that he was locked up for a murder that happened three years prior. In the meantime, business still had to go on. So I'm pregnant, I have the coke, I had some weed, and I had all the business contacts. So what I did is made a ledger of whoever I needed to see to collect money. I made a ledger of who was supposed to get any work from me. But what I did was I moved the business to my mother's apartment because I didn't want anybody to know where I lived at. And plus, when I was pregnant, I was kind of sick. So I needed to be around my family. And again, I'm 21 now. So I'm doing what I need to do. Fritz gave us $40,000 to hire Mel Sachs. At the time, Mel Sachs was one of the top attorneys. A lot of entertainers uh, used Mel Sachs. So I'm like, okay, there's no way we can lose. We got two top lawyers. Ace didn't do it. They talk about something from three years ago. I believe it was May of 1991. I got a knock on my door. I thought it was my little sister. I told her to come upstairs at a certain time. So when I got to the door, a female voice said, Tanya. So I opened up the door. Two masked men and a female rushes in the house and I fall right there by the apartment door. They had three guns to my head. I started swiping at the guns, like to move them from my head in case they something goes off. They was like, take us to the safe. Right before they came, Ace brother was at my house getting some money for their father. In my book, I said it was his cousin, but it was actually his brother. He had just left my house and five minutes later is when I got the knock on the door. They came in and they said, take us to the safe. Right then and there, I knew I was set up. Not too many people knew I had a safe. 
Fritz knew because Fritz is the one that told me to buy the safe in order to put Ace's share of money in there that he was going to be giving me every month or how often he needed to give me the money for the business. There were only maybe four people who knew I had a safe. Like I said, it was Fritz, two of Ace workers, his brother, of course, who just left. So I took him back to the back room into the safe. They got the guns to my head. They pushed me to the floor in front of the safe. It's so crazy that at the time I wasn't nervous. It was just kind of surreal. I just couldn't believe that this was happening. I'm like, are these motherfuckers in my house with guns to my head like I'm being robbed? So I'm opening up the safe, but I'm acting as if I forgot the combination. I knew it. I was just playing and I'm thinking at the same time, just thinking. So one guy goes, I'm going to kill this bitch. So then I go, well, then I'm not opening up nothing. The girl says, Tanya, don't worry, you're going to be okay. So I say, then this nigga need to stop talking crazy. And I was talking exactly like that because, again, I just could not believe that this was going on. As I'm opening up the safe, she takes off my diamond engagement ring that Ace bought me. It was a beautiful ring. I open it. But before I open it, I say, listen, I'm going to open it, take what y'all want, just don't kill me and my baby. And I said it just like that. I think I even told them that they can tie me up, just don't hurt me. I wanted them to feel comfortable to go ahead in there, get what they want, and get on out. So I open up the safe, they take the money out, about a hundred something thousand dollars. They take weed, they take all my jewelry off the dresser, and they take a ledger, the ledger. I was more concerned about the ledger than anything else because the ledger had names and numbers, no addresses. But even if it didn't have numbers, the names, you know, having names and having money by the names, uh, let them know who else has money. So that could have potentially got someone else robbed. It could have got someone else set up. Also, if that book landed anywhere with the authorities, I could have been in deep trouble because that's conspiracy to distribute. So I could have got a charge for that. That is what was on my mind. You know, God held me down. I had one that was kind of feeling real itchy, saying he was going to kill me. After I had opened up the safe and got on a bed, that same one told me to put a pillow on my head. I was not doing that. I told him straight up, I'm not putting no pillow on my head. I was like, oh, this nigga watch too much TV. And you know, some people do things just to get the feeling of how it feels to shoot somebody or do something. I wasn't going to even give him that opportunity. I went back upstairs and called my daughter's grandmother and I told her straight up, your son just got me robbed. I told Ace, he didn't really want to believe it, but he believed it after a while. So then I spoke to Fritz you know, Fritz's health was deteriorating at the time. But he said something. I don't know where he got this from. He said, the people that did it is from in that building. So I'm sitting in the back of a BMW with him. It's a dude driving him around. I think his name was Keith. In my head, I'm like, Fritz is losing his mind. I don't want to hear this shit. I don't know what he's talking about. But he said that. Now that's a key point right there. He said they are from in that building. I said, okay. But I knew Ace's brother just left my house. So then I go up, I call Leon, I go uptown, we have a discussion about it. Leon is like, okay, T, don't worry about it. This is what we're gonna do. We're gonna find out who did it. And you know, it was like music to my ears, because I wanted them dead. He said, the girl, we're gonna chop her fingers off, we're gonna chop her hands off since that bitch wanna steal your ring. That was like music to my ears. You find the dudes who did it, they're dead. That was music to my ears. That at the time is what I wanted to hear. That's what I needed to hear, that something was gonna be done. You know, unfortunately, my intentions was if I found Ace brother, he would have been dead. And that's just how I felt because me and my baby could have been dead. You know, people don't understand. You send people in there to do one thing and then things go wrong, anything could have happened. I never saw Ace's brother again. Ace never spoke to his brother again. So after a while, Ace believed that what I told him had to be true because all of a sudden he doesn't see his brother anymore for all these years. Chapter 9 
the end of an era. Hen Dog was a hustler from the Bronx. Henry, a.k.a. Hen Dog, one of the flyest motherfuckers I ever knew. He also hustled on 112th Street. Henry was um, down with Ace and them. He was just a good dude. Big Deb was a hustler from Madison Avenue. Fritz was supposedly supplying both Hen Dog and Big Deb with cocaine. On August 16, 1991, Fritz passed away following an illness. Two days later, T gave birth to a baby girl. After Fritz died, another individual took control of his operation. This individual refused to do business with Hen, Deb, and T. The trio decided to join forces and do their own thing. Unfortunately, in 1992, Hen Dog was shot and killed. T was deeply saddened by his death. Things went from bad to worse. Big Deb got caught up in a federal case. Ace's trial started in early 1992. I just didn't think that they would convict him based on the word of a crackhead. He was ultimately found guilty for a murder he didn't commit. The judge sentenced him to 20 years to life. T still loved Ace, but ultimately she moved on with her life. August 1991, Fritz passes away. August 18th, I'm in a hospital giving birth to my daughter. At this point in time, everybody was on their way down south to Fritz's funeral. That broke my heart, it broke Ace's heart. But then I'm like, okay, Fritz, they know what he was doing for me. Ace is his man. The show must go on as far as me being taken care of. So I had a duo from 12th Street who was in charge. And he sent someone to tell me that he wasn't paying my bills no more. So I go uptown. I go to Leon. I want this nigga dead. He's disrespecting me. Leon goes, hold on, T. We about to get work from him. So I'm looking like, you about to get work from him. He's shitting on me. Big Deb comes to me, he's shitting on her. Henry comes to me, he's shitting on him. So we all fucked up. He's just messing up the family, not taking care of the family, not being loyal in no way. So me, Deb, and Hen got to do other things to get our hustle on to continue doing what we need to do and make money. But in 1992, I think it was around June, Ace was convicted and sentenced to 20 to life. At 22 years old, I didn't know what to do. I was a young mother, so immediately we jumped on paying one of the lawyers to do the appeal. We had already spent about 65,000 on the trial. The appeal was another 25. We immediately gave Levine $25,000 cash. We also paid for a private investigator. So we thinking, we pay this money, Levine could jump on it and get this appeal going and get Ace up out of there. Eventually, that never happened, but, you know, being young, I just had to get on my job and figure out how we was going to do some things. 
how we was gonna keep getting money, how was I gonna survive. After the conviction, I had these two apartments, so I ended up having a downsize. That same year, me, Hen Dog, and Big Deb, we were doing some things, I was gonna do something with her. Big Deb was like the coolest chick. She was her own boss, but of course, you know, she was part of the family, just like with Henry, with Fritz, you know. She was definitely that chick about her business. She was also cool with Rich Porter and AZ and them, because a lot of times I will always see her up on 7th Avenue and 132nd Street as well. So yeah, you know, Big D in the book is really Big Deb, and Hen is Henry. I didn't change his name. And one thing I could say about Hen Dog, he always kept it a thousand. He was always there with me. He made sure I was all right. I spoke to him every other day, if not every day. And then in 1992, I believe it was around the summertime, I get the news that he was shot and killed in the Bronx. My heart was so broken. My world was just crashing. Fritz dying. Chuck got killed. He was a part of the crew. Ace getting convicted. Hen getting killed. It was just so much going on. And at 22 years old, I just didn't know what to do. It was like, it was just too much on a young female to have to take on, as well as trying to run her man's drug operation, collect money from dudes in the street who owe, who now was playing games because Ace locked up, Fritz is dead, Henry is dead, and Hen was the only one that was trying to get the money from everybody and making sure me and my baby was okay. So I just ended up, you know, I moved on with my life, but I was always there for Ace no matter what. Chapter 10, Baby J. Maine grew up in the Abraham Lincoln houses. The Abraham Lincoln houses is a public housing complex in East Harlem. Maine started hustling at an early age. In the mid-80s, a guy named Hector introduced him to the drug game. Hector had a spot on 131st Street, Madison Avenue in Harlem. Hector was associated with a Puerto Rican crack kingpin named Daddy. Daddy was getting money in Harlem and then later in D.C. with Hector and Boogie. Boogie is Maine's older cousin. Maine and his crew hustled back and forth between New York and D.C. In 1988, Hector was shot and killed in Washington, D.C. A few years later, Daddy was also shot and killed in Washington, D.C. Maine was said to be deeply saddened by the loss of his friends. T first met Maine in 1987. Maine was dating T's little sister. T would become like a sister to Maine. Maine also went by the name Baby J. From 1986 to 1997, Maine was in and out of prison. I was introduced to Maine, Jermaine, uh, by my little sister. I guess they started dating at the time. 
ever since then he been in my life then we just became like a family you know him and his little crew they were just the funniest little guys and it was so crazy because they were like 14 15 16 year olds little gangsters and hustlers they was definitely getting money i remember them being out in dc because jermaine and mike murder came under guys like daddy and hector daddy and hector both spanish dudes they were like big brothers, uncles, almost father-like to Baby J and um, Mike Murder. Mike Murder is Max B, the rapper's older brother. So, you know, there were times where Maine would be out in D.C. I remember my sister telling me sometimes the story when he used to be out in D.C. on a payphone. He would just be like, yo, hold on, hold on, hold on. I guess because he was out there on the corner hustling. She said they would be damn near falling asleep on the phone. But I guess he felt safe just being on the phone because I guess he was just out there doing whatever he was doing. Yeah, they were definitely doing their thing. I was kind of impressed to see little dudes like that hustling and getting money as opposed to, you know, having older dudes who I was used to seeing doing it. But they were definitely, you know, had their thing going on. And um, he did D.C., he did Youngtown's or I.O., Later on, he did Hagerstown, Maryland, you know, and we were like a family, you know, even after him and her broke up, we cared about each other. He was there for us. If I made one phone call to him about something, he came and he was going to take care of it. That's one thing I can say. Him and his little crew, they wasn't scared of nobody, wasn't scared to do anything. They was definitely going to handle their business. Our love was like really, really, you know, thicker than blood. Chapter 11, Death Around the Corner 50 was a notorious figure from T's Block on 134th Street. 50 was that dude from the block that wouldn't let nothing go down without him running him up out of there. She'd known him since childhood. Me and 50 go back to like kindergarten. In July 1994, a man named Mike Wolf was shot dead in Harlem. He was allegedly affiliated to the lynch mob. A day later, T was walking home. I was walking from the Jamaican restaurant with my cousin's little sister. She saw 50 speaking to a group of men. I looked up the block and I noticed it was 50 talking to some dudes from 140th Street. T said something was wrong. Now I already knew right then and there, it was really no reason for 50 to be talking to them. Seconds later, she heard gunshots and then saw 50 running towards her. I heard shots. I turn around, I see 50 running towards me. The gunman ran after him and started letting off more shots. The front of 50's shirt was stained with blood from a gunshot wound. T tried to run across the street to escape from the gunfire. But she was struck by a stray bullet. as he ran towards me. All I could see was a red circle in the middle of his chest. The look on 50 face is a look that I will never forget, as if he was saying, damn. 50 always kept a gun on him, always. This particular time, I think he left it in the bodega on a corner. For some reason, I don't know why, if they approached him, he wouldn't have it on him, because he knew better than that. But as he ran towards me, I'm looking at him, there's a guy running behind him. They were running behind him. He was running towards me. I believe I yelled out one of the guy's name as if to say, yo, what y'all doing? Or just for them to stop. But as 50 got closer to me, I turned around to run across the street towards the downtown side of my block. And they were shooting at him again. I didn't feel a shot, but I fell to the ground. I looked up at my little cousin and she was standing there in shock. I got up once I saw 50 laying in front of me. And in my mind, the visions of bodies with white sheets ran through my mind that fast. 
because it's something that I've seen so often and I knew I just couldn't lay there. I said, my baby is upstairs. Her father is doing 20 years in prison. And I just said to myself, I can't leave my baby. I got up. It was a guy from my block that we called Monkey John. He was right there with me, thank God. And he got in the cab with me. So we telling the cab driver, hurry up, go to Harlem Hospital. I started to feel cold. For some reason, I knew inside something was going on because there was no blood outside. I didn't see anything. And I'm like, John, I feel cold. So we ended up getting to the emergency room. I guess he told them I was shot. They immediately tore my clothes off. The bullet went right through me and got stuck in like a little jacket vest that I had on. It was real thin, but it was stuck right there in the jacket. It went through my back out my right breast it punctured my lung and the reason why i didn't see any blood because i was bleeding inside had i laid on the ground and waited for an ambulance i would have smothered to death and died because my lungs were filling up with blood 50 comes rolling in right next to me they split his chest open and began to massage his heart and i'm looking at 50 come on 50 come on 50 come on 50 and they just continuously trying to work on him to keep him alive but like i said when i saw him running towards me most of the shots were in his chest 50 ended up dying right there the shooters were allegedly associates of the lynch mob After the shooting, Leon went to visit T at the hospital to apologize. In 1995, 10 members of the lynch mob were indicted under the Federal RICO Act. The defendants were charged with 15 murders and 9 attempted murders. Fifty was one of the murder victims named in the indictment. On TV, I saw the flares in the street, the yellow tape, the little markers. It was just crazy and surreal. Once again, just to sit there and watch this like this really happened. In the meantime, I'm telling the police and the people in the hospital not to put my name downstairs. That's me thinking on my feet, being from the street, Maybe it was the Godfather where people run up in hospitals. I knew to say, do not put my name downstairs. I didn't want nobody to find me until I spoke to Leon and Lou. In the meantime, my sister goes uptown, runs in on a meeting with Leon, Lou, and some of the shooters, and she goes in. They had no idea that I got shot. She runs in there saying, yo, y'all shot T, y'all going to jail. She was upset, understandably so, and they looking crazy in the face from what she told me. Lou comes out, puts his head down, looks in shock. Leon basically was like, what, T was out there? Yeah, so she going in. I believe it was late that night. A big heavy dude with a white hospital jacket on pushing a tray comes into my hospital room and it's Leon. And I'm wondering, what the fuck? I mean, he could have just came up as a visitor. Why he dressed like he worked for the goddamn hospital? But then again, it made sense because it let me act like I work here, don't let me act like I'm um, someone else who may know something about what happened. It was just crazy. But I told him what happened. He was like, T, don't worry. I'm going to take care of them and I'm going to make sure they take care of you. Whatever that meant. But yeah, that was definitely... um an experience and the way 50 went out me and my girlfriends we had ended up putting something together for him i believe it was in 1995 because of the way that it went down we had a guy named estos who did some very very nice paintings we'd had him do a canvas painting of 50 it was so dope and 24 years later it looked like he just did that painting yesterday that painting still looks good. And we just celebrated 50's life because the way he went out, it just didn't sit right with me. He didn't have a chance. It was unfair. 
it was like four or five against one. And you know, that's how I felt. 1994 and 95 is when the quote unquote lynch mob members started to get arrested. On the indictment, along with 19 other murders or so, they got me down there on the indictment for attempted murder on me and about four other people. Cause that same day I got shot, 50 got shot and maybe a, two other people got shot, but they got shot like in the ankle or the leg. Me and 50 had the worst hits. They ended up getting indicted, going to jail. They got the murder of 50, he's on indictment. Attempted murder of me and the others and some other people that were killed. While in the hospital, I ended up having to get three blood transfusions because I did lose a lot of blood. But um, Harlem saved my life. I will say that Harlem saved my life. I mean, I wouldn't go to them for too much of nothing else, but um, I thank God that they saved my life. Life is so funny because when I got shot, one of my little sister friends was upstairs babysitting my daughter. And she said, for some reason, my daughter started to cry and would not stop as if she felt something. She said that baby was screaming. My baby felt something. But God is good. God is good. Chapter 12, Money, Power, Respect. In 1997, Maine came home after serving a stint in jail. Upon release, he went straight back to dealing drugs. He put together a crew and took over the Lincoln Projects. He quickly established himself as a major player in the Harlem drug scene. Rapper Mace had allegedly disrespected Maine on a song. Maine felt Mace was being disrespectful and wanted to have a conversation with him. Maine attempted to lure Mace into a confrontation. In 1998, he allegedly snatched a chain off Harlem world rapper Cardan. There was an incident at the Gaucho's gym. He had just came out. He was going through a little blood phase, but he wasn't in a gang. He was like a one man blood gang. So I got a call. And if I'm not mistaken, it was my friend Trail who called me and said, Joe T, you need to come to the gym. Main snatching chains. He acting up. So I gets to the gym. And um, he's standing in the middle of the floor, red sweatpants on, white t-shirt, red bandana with some long braids. I'm like, yo, what you doing? Nah, T, fuck that. These niggas gonna respect me. He ended up snatching a chain of a young rapper that was down with Mace Crew. The young rapper, his name was Cardan. He didn't have anything against Cardan. His issue was with Mace. And he wanted Mace to come and get the chain. Now, supposedly Mace and a female that Maine ended up having a daughter with were friends in the past. I don't know the extent of the relationship, but Maine felt like Mace was being disrespectful to his relationship. So he took the chain and his thing was, I want Mace to come and get the chain so he could answer me for being disrespectful. He and I had a conversation and his thing was, nah, T, these niggas gonna respect me. They gonna respect me like they respect Lou. Now, this was in the late 90s. Lou had already done been locked up since 94. So I had to say, okay, you wanna be like Lou? Lou doing 30 years right now. Is that what you want? And like I told him, I'm not sure if that's what Lou will want for you. Because Lou knew Jermaine from being around us. And I'm sure he probably would have schooled him on what he was doing. 
shiny suit dude. I'm not gonna keep on going with this shiny suit dude. I'm talking about Mace. Mace got ran out of Harlem. That's it. Nobody need to wonder. Nobody need to ask nobody else any questions. It's coming from my mouth because it's a fact. He was scared. After he got that chain snatched from his artist, Cardan, we never saw Mace again, heard from him again. Not even sure if he ever came back to New York. In 1998, T started dating a drug dealer named Donald. Donald was somebody I knew for a long time. I definitely loved him. Donald wanted to get married, but T was unconvinced. So, you know, we had our little issues, you know, him cheating. She decided to end the relationship. Sadly, Donald later died after a battle with brain cancer. He had a lump somewhere and I think it went up to his brain. He ended up having brain cancer. In 1999, T and Boogie started dating. Chapter 13, War in Harlem. Pop Lottie was a drug dealer from Harlem. Pop Lottie and his associate had an ongoing beef with Maine. Maine was rumored to have sliced Pop Lottie's face. Mace allegedly sought out protection from Pop Lottie and his associate. On February 1999, Pop Lottie shot Maine five times. Maine miraculously survived the shooting. One night, Boogs called me and said, yo, T, come down to 115th Street and Lex. So when I get down there, a friend of theirs was down there huffing, puffing, almost throwing up. Some guys that was cool with Mace chased him. Now, I don't know if they wanted to kill him or it was a plan knowing that he would go back uptown and get Maine and Boogs and everybody, period. Anyway, so we go back up to Fifth Avenue, Lincoln Projects, we standing around. I happened to be on the side talking to a dude named Dewey. But when I turned around and it was a short period, everybody was gone. So I jumped in my truck, went to my block, and in that little amount of time, it looked like Wild Wild West had just went crazy. All I saw was the friends, light blue CLK in the middle of the street. So I'm looking, I'm wondering where the hell everybody at. Then my cell phone rings. And when I pick it up, all I hear is moaning, but it's Jermaine. But I'm like, oh my God, is he somewhere dying? What the hell is going on? I then get a call from Bugs. They made it to Harlem Hospital. Jermaine was all right. The story was that they got to 8th Avenue, Maine standing in front of Pop Lottie. Bugs is arguing with the other dude. Now while Bugs is arguing with the other dude, he not really paying too much attention, but all he see is fire come out the guy's pocket. He starts shooting through his coat. Then I guess Pop Lottie got nervous and just start letting off shots. Five of them hit Jermaine and then it just cleared out. But luckily he made it to the hospital. He was okay. I'm glad Jermaine didn't die. And I wasn't mad at Pop either. I understand what happened and he was scared. All I know is that Boogie was gone and Maine was gone. After those five shots, I was like, oh my God, what have they done? Cause he was just on a roll. He was singing that Tupac record. I was like, oh Lord, what's gonna happen now? In April, 1999, Mace announced he was retiring from music. Mace moved to Atlanta while a war ensued between Pop Lottie and Maine. Maine was making obscene amounts of money selling heroin and cocaine. He was fast becoming one of Harlem's richest people. In 
2000, Pop Lottie's associate was shot dead. It was rumored Maine allegedly paid someone to have him killed. We never saw Mace again, heard from him again, not even sure if he ever came back to New York. But what he did was enlisted two guys from my block who kind of already had an issue with Maine. So it only made sense that he took these guys on and said, listen, I need your help. I'm just assuming this will happen because they seem to be going hard for him. So these two dudes, you know, they had a little issue back and forth with Maine. One of them was a really, really good friend of mine. I loved him to death. Another one was a friend of mine, but me and him ain't really get along too well. You know, we grew up together. But Pop Lottie, he was the funniest dude. But him and Jermaine had they beef. And, you know, when it comes to the streets, I kind of sort of had to pick a side. You know, that's my little brother. That's my friend. And then he's over there with somebody else that I don't even get along with. It just seemed like it was just spiraling out of control. Mace left. He left a beef behind and didn't help a look out for nobody. He's a coward. He need to stop going on a breakfast club and radio shows or doing any type of interview saying he wasn't ran out of Harlem because he was. And understandably, if you're not a shooter or about that life, you should run. If you out, you making records, you being disrespectful, then you supposed to stay and stand up like a man. That's what you're supposed to do. He did not do that. He left a lot of bullshit back here in Harlem. And like I said in my book, it was a beef that spiraled out of control and six people are dead today because that beef kind of went back and forth. You know, I wish I could have intervened. The beef between Maine and the other guys continued. It was one guy in particular who I said I knew I grew up with, but he and I wasn't close. We really wasn't friends. You know, he was a thorough guy too from my block and you know, he was about his business as well. And I guess he just had a strong dislike for Maine. Something happened and someone from Maine's crew ended up getting shot in the arm. And I think that's when things kind of turned serious because there were shootouts back and forth, but nobody really got hit except for the time when Maine got shot five times. But when someone really close to Maine got hit, Maine felt like, okay, I got to do something. Now, it's alleged that Maine put 15000 on this guy's head. There was a guy that used to be on my block. He was not from my block. I knew him well. He and I were really cool. He was cool with the crew that Maine was against. Their own man took the bounty. And allegedly, this guy, Lord, the guy that Maine put the bounty on to the Bronx, I don't know where, if it was in a project building, I don't know where it was at. The play was that he was bringing a guy so they can kidnap Maine or maybe kill him or rob him or something like that. He had no idea that he was being lured to his own death. And I guess when he got there, he realized that he had been set up and his own man had did it. Now, I got calls the very next morning. We all heard that this particular dude got killed and it was already in the streets the next day that allegedly Maine may have paid for it to be done. Me and my sister just couldn't believe what was going on and what was being said. Then I saw him walking around with this particular guy that took the bounty and I was a little upset about that. And I'm telling him like the word on the street, you know, what's going on. He's like, nah, sis, anything good. But I just was feeling very uneasy about it. This guy who got killed, you know, he had people that loved him as well. It was said that, you know, Maine was going to get it. And then I really, really feared for his life. I just knew that something bad was going to happen. But it just goes to show that there's definitely no loyalty. And money is the root to all evil for your man to take the bounty and set you up for a few dollars. Nobody can be trusted out here. On June 23, 2000, Maine was shot and killed on 133rd and 5th Avenue. When I got to 133rd and 5th Avenue, which was Maine's block that he grew up on, it was almost like everything stood still. 
Everybody was standing around, looking sad, in shock. And right then and there, I just knew. I just knew, I just couldn't believe it. I was just like, damn, they got my baby. Like, you know, Jermaine died that night. And when I say I've never felt pain like that in my life, we were not blood relatives, but nothing, there was nothing that can describe us. Our connection and our relationship, you know, we were more than family. There was nothing I wouldn't do for him. There wasn't nothing that he wouldn't do for me. And his death, literally almost killed me. I just didn't know what to do. I was walking the streets just like, it was just something that I just could not handle. And again, like I said, you know, the pain that I felt, I cannot imagine what his mother felt because she lost the child. I cannot imagine what she was feeling and his siblings. I lost weight, I cut all my hair off. I mean, it took me years to get over him and I still miss him like it happened yesterday. It's been 18 years and um, it doesn't hurt as much, but we will never forget him. And that's just how it is. Like the love that we had was just, it was undeniable. There are a lot of articles and people was on radio and people posting about what happened. For the record, Pop Lottie did not kill Jermaine. Like I said, it was the boogeyman, and we're going to leave it like that. A year later, Pop Lottie was shot and killed. In 2005, Lou Sims instructed T to leave New York for her own safety. T left New York and moved to Atlanta. Now, it may have been a year or so after Maine was killed that I heard Pop Lottie was killed. I heard a little about what may have happened. I really don't know. It may have had something to do with Jermaine. I'm not sure. But yeah, he ended up being killed. Another mother was hurting because she lost a child. I was sad that that had happened to him. I got a call from Lou and Lou said, listen, I know you're upset. You got to get it together. He got some insight on some people saying that they were going to do something to me. So he said, I need you to get out of New York. I told them, nobody better not touch you. A touch of hair on your head. He said, but T, I'm not there. I'm not there to protect you, so you need to get out of New York. That's how I got down to Atlanta. I just needed to move down to Atlanta, and this was like 2005, five years later after his death. I was still angry. In 2008 is when I had to get on my knees and forgive the person that killed him because I was walking around mad and angry and the person that killed him was going on living their life and probably happy that they accomplished what they wanted to do because maybe they were hurting. I started writing maybe 2005, 2006 and it was a form of therapy. It was therapeutic for me to get it out because I was holding so much in and um, that's how Harlem Heron came about. In 2004, Mace returned to the rap world. The murders of Maine and Pop Lottie still remain unsolved. Her name is Miss T, and she is the Harlem heroine.
Now subscribe to my YouTube channel, Straight Talk with Miss T. It's going to be the same thing I gave you in my book, Straight Talk. We're going to have lots of fun. We're going to have some interviews. We're going to have some good conversation. Straight Talk with Miss T. My book, Harlem Heron, can be found on Amazon, Kindle, The Nook, as well as iBooks. It can be purchased at www.mistebooks.net. That's www.mstebooks.net. My Instagram is Harlem Heroin or Heroin, H-E-R-O-I-N-E. 